Hello everyone, time for us to get into the next module, Cryptographic Solutions. Here we're going to check out a bit about how cryptography works, what different kinds of cryptography exist, and most importantly understand how to look at cryptography and decide that's good for that and that's better for this. So let's get into it. Now before we dive headfirst into cryptography properly, I want to tell you about encryption's cousin, hashing. No, not that kind of hash. What this type of hashing is, is it's an algorithm that gives you a message digest of any input data you give it. And it is very, very consistent in how it works. Now, when I say it's consistent, each and every time it'll give us the same results. Okay, but what kind of results? Well, first up, this length of the hash on the output will be the exact same, regardless of whether the file is one megabyte or one gigabyte. The length of the output that we get from the algorithm is going to be exactly the same size. Cool. The only difference will be, though, when you're doing the hash value of a large file, it does take long to co longer to compute. But also, the output will always be the same when you give the hash algorithm or hash function the same input file. So it's consistent in that as well. And another important thing about hashing is it is a one-way operation. That means that there is no such thing as dehashing, like there is with encryption, where you've got decryption. But there are ways around hashing that hackers have found. I'll tell you a little bit about them just now, though. Now, another interesting thing as well is that older hash utilities are prone to a effect called collisions. According to the mathematics that is developed for hashing, you should never actually get the same hash value with two separate input files that are completely different. However, due to converting the decimal mathematics that we work with and some of the other special mathematics that the really clever guys deal with, when we turn that into computer code, sometimes it doesn't go so smoothly. And you can land up in a, in a situation where one of your older utilities is actually giving you the same hash value for two different input files. And the greater the chance of collision, the less we trust the hashing to be reliable for security beyond just validating that this data file is the way it was when you sent it to me or when you uploaded it to a website or something like that. An example of an older hash utility that we have to be a bit careful about is Message Digest 5 or MD5. Newer utilities are a little bit less prone to collisions like SHA-256 or anything that's got a higher value than 256, so like SHA-384 and SHA-512. So we've got that going for us. Now, to use hashing, a couple tools you can check out. If you're rocking Linux, you've got the MD5 sum, SHA-256 sum, and a whole bunch of other similar hash commands that you can run. Just give it the file name and it'll spit out the appropriate hash value. Now in Windows, you can use the internal command, cert util space dash hash file, space and then the full path to your file and space the hash function you want to use. Or you could use a third party app like Hash My Files where you just download it, run it and tell it what file to hash. And it gives you quite a few different hash values that you could work with. Either way though, that's hashing. Now let's get into cryptography properly. Cryptography has a couple concepts that we need to clarify, especially when it comes to the terminology. Um, a lot of it's very similar and actually in some cases interchangeable. And you're going to probably catch me doing it quite a bit where I jump between the common lingo and then the technically correct lingo. But let's get that lingo jotted out now. So first up, the term that most people have heard is encryption, where we usually use an algorithm and a couple variables to alter and adjust the data. Another name for encryption is encoding or enciphering. Then we have decryption, the opposite, where we take the encrypted data and reverse it back to the original information that we would like to be able to work with. Another name for this is decoding, obviously the counterpart to encoding. And we also have deciphering. Cool. Then plain text or clear text or simply unencrypted data. The thing that we're basically encoding or decoding, enciphering or deciphering, you get the idea. So always remember, plain text or clear text is completely viewable to anyone, whether they get a copy of the file or see it being transmitted across the network. 
then the encrypted data is referred to correctly as ciphertext, considering that the correct term for the cryptographic algorithm is the cipher. Now I did say just now that these algorithms use a bunch of variables, and there's a variable or two that matter quite a lot. Because if encryption is meant to like lock up your data and unlock the data if you're meant to get to it, well, the most important thing when it comes to a lock is a key. And in terms of cryptography, the key, or keys in some cases, are super important to look after because that's what makes it easy for my computer to decrypt anything you send to me in an encrypted format. However, if I am a bad person, a threat actor of some kind, and I intercept some encrypted data you're sending to one of your friends, I will attempt something called cryptanalysis, which most people will know of as cracking encryption. So now that we've got those concepts ironed out, let's check out something else. Like, how do we tell these ciphers apart? The really big thing when it comes to cryptography is to start out by choosing a good cipher for the situation or scenario you are dealing with. Obviously, a couple of other things do come into the equation as well, but a bad cipher is a bad cipher. So, first thing that we want to look at as a distinguishing characteristic of our cryptographic solutions or ciphers is the key. And the key may be either symmetric or asymmetric. I'm going to elaborate on what those two things are just now and show you exactly how those keys actually work for us. But another important thing once we've decided whether we go symmetric or asymmetric is how long is that key? The longer the bit length of the key, the more possibilities there are and therefore the more time an attacker needs to spend trying to crack that encryption. So another thing we can also use to distinguish our ciphers is how it processes the data. And we will get to it in a moment or two, but the first thing is stream and block ciphering. Those are our main two options. Okay, cool. can work with that. And with just these five things, we can actually pick apart and decide whether a particular cipher suite or individual cipher or algorithm is any good. All right, so first up, let's look at the data processing. Let's get the easy stuff out of the way first. And first up is block encryption. Now the idea of block encryption, or ciphering, is we take our data and stick it into nicely formed blocks. So I could take a message like, hello mom, and stick it into a couple of logical blocks. In this case, my logical blocks are two by two grids. Uh, left to right, top to bottom, and then move on to the next one. So we get hello mom written like that. Then a block cipher would then decide how those blocks are gonna get encrypted. And there it is. Capital P, percentage 6, P, 9, V, close, curly brace, and X. Okay, cool. So that message got encrypted in chunks, basically. Now, block ciphering is pretty cool for a few things. But we also have stream ciphering as well. So with stream ciphering, or stream encryption, the data gets processed one bit at a time. And essentially, the cipher is just deciding whether it's going to flip a bit or leave it be. So the stream of 101100110 could have its bits flipped where it becomes 0111000110. And an attacker trying to intercept that data stream wouldn't actually know which bits were the way they were meant to be and which ones had been flipped. Although they'd probably be able to tell that stream ciphering had taken place because the data would make no sense. Then again though, the data would make no sense with block ciphering as well. They'd have to try and figure out what we use to communicate. Now, let's deal with the real big thing. This is the topic that a lot of people get hung up on and can really get confused about. And if you're tackling some exams, like for example, Comptia Security Plus, you could easily get turned around and twist, mixed up with this concept in the exam. So let's spend a good bit of time here. And the first one is symmetric encryption. So with symmetric encryption, Operative word here is symmetric or symmetry, which implies the same on both sides. So with symmetric encryption, what we have is the same cryptographic key that gets used to perform both the encryption and the decryption operation. Okay, cool. How does that look? Well, if I have two devices here, device A and device B, I put the same encryption key on both of them. And depending on who's talking to who, 
the, the one will use that key to encrypt and the other one will use that same key to decrypt. So if I take the plain text file and feed it into a cipher, I will then use that key that device A has to create the cipher text. Now if I wanted to, I could transmit that data to device B. Device B receives the cipher text, feeds it into the appropriate cipher or decipher technically, and uses the exact same key that device A used to encrypt it. And out popped the plain text file. Okay, cool. Basically, it's like the key to your front door. The key that you use to lock your door is the same key you would use to unlock it. That's easy to relate to. And it's one of the reasons why you must always keep a close eye on where your house keys are. Now, symmetric encryption has some interesting characteristics. Otherwise, it wouldn't be talk, talked about anymore. The first one is the keys can actually be relatively short and still be considered quite good. For instance, if you go around and find out a particular symmetric cipher is using like a 256-bit length key, that's actually pretty good for a symmetric cipher. And because of that key being short, it makes the symmetric encryption process a lot lighter on your processing resources. You don't need as much CPU power. You don't need as much working space in RAM, etc., etc., which means it's a faster operation to perform. However, symmetric encryption is not without its drawbacks. For instance, the key distribution can be a bit of a challenge, like using it for network communications. I need to get that key onto both device A and B in a way that it is not exposed. So how am I going to do that? And then the next question would be, how would I do that at scale for an entire organization? It can be quite challenging. So key scalability also becomes an issue because of that key distribution challenge we have. And another issue is, everybody who uses that same key, if one of those keys gets compromised, all those that are using that same key are also now at risk. So it's a quicker, easier encryption process to perform, but the key management is a lot more important to deal with effectively. You've got to be on top of making sure those keys are difficult to access and that they're backed up and that you are monitoring the situation so that you know if an attacker has ever compromised and had access to asymmetric key of yours. What about asymmetric? Is that going to help us? Oh yes, you betcha. So again, operative word here is asymmetric or asymmetrical, meaning it's not the same. We use two keys. We use a private key and a public key. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to my wording because we're going to do some pretty interesting things with public and private keys in a little bit once we've got this basics of asymmetric down. Uh, and I don't want you to get confused. And that is, if one key is used to encrypt, only the other key can decrypt it. Okay? So if you have the key that encrypts the data, fantastic, you can encrypt data. If you, Emma, don't have the key that decrypts it, you can't decrypt it, even though you know what the plain text look like and what the um, cipher text looks like. It ain't that simple. Believe me, people smarter than you and definitely smarter than me have been working on this for a long time to make sure we can't easily break things like this. So let's see how that works. Well, it's going to get a little bit crazy, so hold on. Again, we're going to have device A and device B, but this time their keys are going to be different. And the keys that we're going to keep in device A and device B, we're going to refer to those as private keys. And the reason why we like to call them private keys is because they are never shared. Device A, once it generates its private key, never gives it to anyone. The same for device B, never shares that key. But they need another key as well to work with all of this. So they're both going to generate something called a public key. The public key is related to the private key. So device A has his orange public key and device B has his brighter red public key. But they're related to their corresponding privates. They have this formula, operation, algorithm, whatever you want to call it, that takes the private key and a bunch of other variables and uses that to calculate a corresponding public key. And those keys are obviously relatable. And what's really cool about the public key is if a hacker or any other type of threat actor sees it, they cannot magically tell what your private key was because they don't know all the variables. If you need to solve a uh, algebraic formula and figure out what the value of x is, 
If there are too many variables that you don't know the value of, you can't work out what x is. You can just rearrange the formula so that x equals whatever the rest of the formula looks like. Now for device A and B to properly use asymmetric encryption, especially for like a data transmission across the network, they've got to do something called a key exchange, where device A sends a copy of its key to device B, its public key. Okay? And then device B does the same thing. Device B sends a copy of its public key to device A. So now device A has B's public key, or at least a copy of it, and B has a copy of device A's public key. The private keys stay on the devices. And now what's going to happen here is when device A wants to send something, takes this plain text, takes the cipher, feeds the data, and the copy of device B's public key into that cipher. So device A is going to use device B's public key to encrypt the data here. Cool. Now that results in the ciphertext. The ciphertext is now unintelligible to anybody outside of this operation, therefore it's safe to send to B. B then takes the appropriate decipher operation and uses its private key to decrypt and get the plain text. So let's quickly recap that for a second because I know a lot of people can lose track here. Device B generated its own private key. How? Don't worry about that right now. And then it used an algorithm with a bunch of variables, including the private key, to generate the public key. So only device B knows the relationship between those two keys. And device B is going to send a copy of that public key to device A. Device A uses that to encrypt. Now that the ciphertext exists, only device B could decrypt it because only device B has the other key. So if I encrypt something with your public key, only you could decrypt it with the private key. Cool. Sounds great. Sounds like this is the perfect solution to symmetric. And in some ways it is because it gives us a lot of privacy for public transmission. So it actually makes it great for network communications, especially across the Internet. And the public key distribution is very, very scalable because I don't mind you seeing my public key. Because if you encrypt something with my public key, I hold the private key so nobody else could decrypt it except me. Cool. But the private key cannot be derived from the public key, which is where the safety comes in here. As long as one of the keys is kept safe, we're good. And that's the private key, obviously, because the name implies you keep it private. But obviously, these cool benefits that address symmetric's weaknesses don't come without their drawbacks. The keys need to be longer. If you come to me and tell me you've got a 256-bit asymmetric key, I'm a bit worried. For symmetric, 256 bits is not bad, but for asymmetric, it's dreadful. I only feel comfortable when we start talking about 1,024 or 2,048 bits in an asymmetric key. So you need a much longer key for the attacker to have a tough time doing cryptanalysis. This means that there's a greater processing burden on this type of cryptography. Thankfully, though, our computers are way better than they used to be, so the processing burden is a lot less noticeable to the average person but what if you've got a server receiving a lot of encrypted data from many users at once? Then you've got to be a little bit more mindful about the processing burden of this cryptography. And that means you might experience greater latency while performing any sort of encrypted communications or decrypting any encrypted communications. So it's not perfect, which is why Symmetric still exists. Symmetric makes up for Asymmetric's weaknesses and Asymmetric makes up for Symmetric's weaknesses. All right. Now, if you need to, please don't be afraid to re-watch that bit about the asymmetric encryption. It is a tricky thing to get your head around, but I promise you will have that eureka moment. Okay, but let's move on now. And use that asymmetric. And this is where a lot of people battle with the keys, the private and the public keys. Okay, so hold on. And if you feel after this a little bit, you need to go back and watch that asymmetric section again. Don't be afraid to go back. So let's do digital signatures. Trust me, this freaks out people. It's weird. But let's check out what we're going to do here. So let's divide the screen into two and look at the encryption of the data and transmitting it so that somebody can go and decrypt that data. Cool. Now the goal of digital signatures here is we are going to use public key cryptography, the asymmetric stuff, with hashing to provide authentication, integrity, and non-repudiation of a transmission. 
because you could send me your public key, I send you some encrypted data, but that doesn't prove you could trust me. It doesn't prove I'm a safe person. As long as someone has your public key, they can send you encrypted data. So the idea of the digital signature is a way for me to prove, hey, listen, I'm the one who sent you this thing. So for digital signatures to work, we go through that whole key exchange thing where I get a copy of your public key and you get a copy of mine. Device A gets B's, B gets A's. Great stuff. So after sending an encrypted message, what the sender will do is they'll take the plain text file and feed it into a hash function. And that obviously results in a hash of the message. Then we take that hash value of the message and we feed it into an encryption cipher. And what I do next is I take my private key. If I'm the sender, I take my private key and encrypt the data. Now remember, no one has my private key except me. Okay? I'm the only one with it. Cool. Now hold on. We send that encrypted hash. And then, as the receiver, you would take that encrypted hash message, run it through the appropriate decipher operation, and you would use the public key I gave you. So you've got my public key. And for you to decrypt something that I encrypted with my private key, it had to have come from me. Because if it was not me, and the public, key, your, the public key that was given to you was different, you would not be able to decrypt this properly. Now, how do you know if you've decrypted it properly or not? Well, what you do is you take the received hash message you've worked out, then you take the plain text file that I sent you, and you hash it with the same hash function. And you've got the calculated hash value for yourself. And all you have to do is compare the two. If they're different, it wasn't me. If they're the same, it was me. Now, let me explain to you where people get tripped up here. We can encrypt stuff with a private key. There's no rule that says we can't. The way I described the asymmetric encryption earlier was if one key does the encryption, only the related other key can do the decryption. So generally with transmissions, for normal data I want to send to you, I encrypt with your public and you decrypt with your private so only you could ever view it. But to back that up, you've got a copy of my public key, I've got my private key. If I encrypt something with my private key, being the related key, nobody else could have generated that message and decrypt it with my public key if it wasn't me. So it's a way of proving, hey, I sent you this and here's the proof of it. It cannot be easily forged. Obviously, it can be forged, but it's a lot of hard work. And that's what we're after here, is messing with the attackers. Now, this might be a bit tricky, but always remember, if one key encrypts, the other one can decrypt. And at no point do I ever send the private key. The private key remains on me, and that is why it's private. Cool. Before we move on, let's just have a quick reminder here. When one key encrypts, the other one decrypts. The public key is public because we share it. That's it. The private key is private because we don't share it. And if the received hash doesn't match the calculated value, something is not right. And this helps us because obviously authentication, integrity, non-impudiation, all that cool stuff. Just from proving that the message was original. Sweet. Let's look at an interesting counterpart that could work interestingly with cryptography. We haven't done anything to authenticate. That's where digital certificates can come in. You can think of digital certificates as third-party validation. The idea is, I'm talking to you, you're talking to me, device A, device B, you get the idea. And an independent entity can act as a validator between the two of us. So that's pretty cool. And digital certificates are extensively used on the internet. I mean, you might have had a, the occasional time when you're browsing the web and you go to a site and it gives you some sort of certificate error message. That's normally because something's not okay with the digital certificates. The most popular implementation of digital certificates is the X509 standard, uh, more commonly known as public key infrastructure. And here's the funny thing. I've already explained the first half of the fundamentals of public key infrastructure to you. The asymmetric encryption, where device A sends stuff to device B, with the public key and the private key. That's the beginning of public key infrastructure. Now, please be aware, though, you don't have to use public certificates on the Internet. You could do your own private certificates. 
So for instance, I've got a few things on my home network where I've issued my own certificates to them. The only problem is those certificates will not be trusted outside of the domain in which they are used. So if you connected to one of the mini servers on my home network and your browser was looking for the certificate and my server presented it to it, your browser wouldn't like it because it wouldn't be able to find out is the certificate genuine or is this just a really interesting fake? It wouldn't be able to tell. So how does digital certificates work? Let's bring device A and device B back in here. I'm going to bring them their private keys and obviously they're going to have their public keys for this. Now for digital certificates to work, we need that third party. That third party is called the certificate authority. And what they do is they issue, you guessed it, certificates. One for device A and one for device B. Please note the little star thingy on the certificates that I put there matches device A and B's public key color for a reason. Uh, there is going to be a relationship between the keys and the certificates. But either way, device A and B can use these certificates to validate authenticity. So what could happen now is if you are device B and I'm device A and I'm sending you something um, and you get a little bit worried, how do I know a hacker isn't playing piggy in the middle? Uh, we used to call it man in the middle. I think the new name for it now is an on-path attack. We'll come into it again later, don't worry. Uh, another video late, later in the series. Uh, or how do you know an attacker hasn't been imp impersonating me since the very beginning? So what you could do is say, as device B, hey, device A, can I see your certificate, please? And I would need to send you my certificate. But the problem is a certificate needs to have something in it that is tied to me. So I want you to think of these digital certificates like a passport. As a passport, it's going to be able to identify you or me in another country. It's going to have my name, my age, my place of birth, my address, my citizenship, stuff like that. But the problem is no one's going to really like my passport until there's a photo of me in it, which allows for a quick and easy validation of, yep, that's you. So what has to happen is device A and device B have to do a signing request for their digital certificates. Now, what happens with the signing request is device A sends its public key to the certificate authority. The certificate authority validates that this public key was generated correctly and embeds it into the certificate and sort of reissues it. And the same thing is done for device B. My photo is now in my passport. So if you are worried about, am I really who I say I am? And you challenge me, I can then send you my certificate. And what you then go and do is you can then go and query with the certificate authority, hey, is this certificate genuine? Is this legit? Can I trust this? And the certificate authority will obviously tell you whether it's okay or not okay. We'll have a look at how it does it just now. But obviously there's one problem a lot of people would have with this type of solution, and that is you don't want to have a single central authority telling you that, yes, you can trust this person or no, you can't, because obviously if somebody were to compromise that one certificate authority there, we'd have a bit of a problem because then we could not trust the certificates and we need that certificate to validate, yeah, I can trust you on the other side of the internet or no, I can't. So what's going to happen is we actually have the opportunity to have many certificate authorities. I can have certificate authority one issuing digital certificates to device A and his friends in the same network. And we could have certificate authority number two issuing separate certificates, obviously, to device B and any of device B's friends. And now what will happen is if device B doesn't trust A or wants to just be sure it really is A, it can send a challenge and the certificate can be sent in return. And then device B needs to obviously validate that certificate. And when device B goes and speaks to its certificate authority or the senders, depending on who's more likely and easier to be accessed, the certificates can be fine, even though they came from a different place, as long as there is a trust relationship between those two entities. So, for instance, if somebody from France wants to go visit the USA, they get on a plane, they fly to America, and they present their passport. And at the American airport, that passport would be trusted because immigration control in America, I always forget what they're called, uh, has a trust relationship with the entities in France that issue passports. As long as there's a trust between the CAs, I will trust your certificate, even though it doesn't come from the same place minded. As long as it's trusted, we're good. Okay. 
Now, how does the certificate authority's infrastructure look? Well, first up, you get something called a root certificate authority server. This is the head honcho of the entity that generates and validates certificates. Now, the root CA is a bit of an interesting fellow because what makes him the root? Why do we trust him? Because he says so. Which I know is not the best basis for this, but at some point you need to start somewhere with a trust relationship. And what happens is an administrator who sets up a root CA server is doing so to have secure infrastructure. So at some point we have to trust it. And then we just need to make sure that we're going and doing the best to keep our root CAs safe and secure. Now I want you to think of the root CA as like the place where your passport would be made, where it'd be printed and bound and your photo stuck in there and all that cool stuff. Because wherever you went to apply for your passport, I can guarantee you that's not where it's made. Um, you probably went to some sort of branch location for that governmental organization that issues passports. And that location is a subordinate CA. Now, the idea of the subordinate CA is it can generate and um, validate and send certificates on behalf of the root CA server. Because the root gives the subordinate certificate authority server the permission and authority to do so. And this means that there is at least one machine between an attacker and the entity that could be the ultimate authority on which certificates are trusted and untrusted, at least within that environment. And the subordinates can be made to be a bit more publicly secure. Now, a very common strategy I've seen a lot of um, public certificate authority organizations do is they will have their root CA offline most of the time and their subordinates issuing on behalf of that root and then periodically the root is brought online and then properly validates any certificates that were issued in the interim or renewed during the interim period. And that helps to keep the infrastructure a bit more secure. But another idea is to do a registration authority. Now, a registration th authority could either be connected to the root CA or a subordinate CA. It's up to you. But what makes the registration authority different to the subordinate is the registration authority despite the name, is actually not able to issue or register a new certificate. All it does is basically is act as a transmission avenue for one of the other certificate authority servers. So if the root or the subordinate generates the certificate, the RA just passes it along. If somebody wants to check the validity of a certificate, the RA just checks whether it's valid or not. That would probably be like the immigration officer at the airport or a seaport or something like that. Now, what are they checking all this against, though? What's the big thing? Well, every certificate, like a passport, gets issued with a unique number. We call it the certificate serial number. And if anything funny or dodgy happens, or a certificate gets abused in a way, like, for example, two passport numbers at two different airports at an impossible time, you get something called the revocation list, where we keep track of the certificate serial numbers that we don't trust anymore. And all of the CA servers, including the RA or the Registration Authority, maintain a copy of the revocation list. And whenever somebody wants to query a certificate, what they're asking their CA is, hey, is this certificate on a revocation list? And if they get a yes, it is, that's when you get that error on a web browser, for example, um, something is dangerous, click here to go back to safety or advanced options. And if you're brave enough to click on the word advanced options, which most average users aren't, you'll find the option to continue anyway. Oftentimes we use the word advanced just, just to hide a choice away from the end user. Might not actually be that advanced, but scares them away sometimes. Anyway, moving along though. Next up, what's in the certificate? Well, most importantly, certificate subject names. Uh, that identify what this entity is so we can see, okay, cool, you claim to be this device and I want to know if you really are. So the first thing that normally gets included is the common name. It is considered legacy nowadays and the standards have deprecated them, but it is still widely used in many implementations just in case you're dealing with a legacy system. Also, some developers who want to directly code their certificate validation function into an application might be following the old techniques. So that's one of the other reasons why a lot of people tend to keep implementing the common name. The better alternative nowadays, the pun I promise is not intended, is the subject alternative name. 
Now, the subject alternative name is a little bit more expansive and flexible and deals better with modern internet infrastructure because it can include either the device's name and or its IP address. And I normally encourage that it includes both. And what's quite cool is the subject alternative name can deal with multiple host names. It can also be used for multiple subdomains. So if you've got your organization with www.sales.business.com and www.it.business.com and www.marketing.business.com, you could have one certificate covering those subdomains, which is pretty cool. And even cooler would be a wildcard where you just say asterisk.business.com. And that would deal with all hosts and all subdomains that could exist. That's pretty freaking sweet. The only catch is the host must be configured with a fully qualified domain name for the subject alternative name to actually validate. And remember, a fully qualified domain name is the host dot lower level domain dot root level domain. So that would be www, the host name for the web server, dot business, the subdomain, normally your name, dot com, the top level domain being dot com. That would be a fully qualified domain name. Okay. Next up, let's talk about protecting the keys that we are using in our digital certificates. One method is to do TPM module protection. The TPM module chip on your computer is considered a crypto processing chip, and it can validate keys and even store them, but it has got a very limited capacity. So be cool and careful with that. Uh, usually you want to be using a TPM module 1.2 or higher for key storage. Um, 2.0 would be better for key storage and key processing. Or you could look at using a hardware security module, an HSM. This could be a removable component or a dedicated component within your computer. And besides being able to store keys, one of the really big things it does is it offloads crypto processing to an ASIC circuit or chipset. ASIC being Application Specific Integrated Circuit. It's basically a processing unit that is designed to do one thing and one thing exceptionally well. Any of you who have dabbled with uh, cryptocurrency mining, especially Bitcoin, you probably know quite a bit about ASICs already. For those of you who haven't, well, if your computer's got a graphics card, that is an ASIC because it is a processing unit that is geared towards a particular kind of processing graphical rendering in this example. So the HSM usually includes a highly specialized processor for encryption and decryption operations. And what's quite cool is they also usually have pretty interesting tamper detection capabilities. As anybody who tries to alter stuff that is not supported by, or is supported by anything but the HSM, it is detected. It's pretty cool. But to me, one of the things I'm most interested in is making sure that we have a secure enclave. A secure enclave is a way of protecting data that is sitting in RAM. So in general, what happens is with secure enclaves, whatever put the data in RAM is the only thing allowed to read that memory address, nothing else. So the idea is whatever loads the keys into RAM to perform either an encryption or a decryption operation on that computer, only that thing may access it. That's pretty cool, actually. I like secure enclaves, and this is usually performed at the OS level. And as long as your operating system is relatively modern, this is usually supported. Uh, and it's a nice feature. And please be aware, it's not bulletproof, but I dig it. It's a very clever idea because it's protecting the keys in a very vulnerable position, which is sitting there in memory, possibly accessible to many applications and services. All right. But we have other ways to protect the keys as well. We need to also make sure we're backing our keys up. Because if anything ever happens to the, the machine that's got the data and the decryption key, uh, and I don't have a copy of that decryption key, well, then having my data is not much good. So you need to obviously do key backups. But remember, there's a possibility that attackers might target your backups. So you need to treat your backups with as much security and concern as you do your active production systems. So, for example, if I'm going to go and back up my keys on a special hard drive or tape drive, I make sure that drive is disconnected and locked away somewhere secure in the building, not sitting there in the reception drawer waiting for somebody to have a look. Another thing we need to look at is also key escrow. 
Now, key escrow is the idea of third-party backup. And it originally came from software development, where you might want to, for example, outsource software development to a company that specializes in programming for other organizations, custom applications. And there's always the risk that the outsourced development company might liquidate before they finish your product. So the idea of source code escrow was born, where the developer would back up the data with a trusted entity that's not going to liquidate and disappear over the weekend. And if they did, if that developer did liquidate, at least you would be able to access the source code or, and how much had been done on it and to carry on with it or hand it off to somebody else. Now, for cryptographic keys, key escrow is where you back up your key with a trusted third party. This might be a requirement in a business partnership agreement of some kind where both organizations want to make sure that they can decrypt the data of the others in the event that other organization goes under, but the surviving entity needs access to the data store. And in some countries, it's actually a, a requirement for law enforcement in case they get the appropriate permission or warrant or whatever is the right term for wherever you are to intercept your communications and review your data. So it might be a legal requirement for law enforcement. They'll have to rock up at the escrow agent with a warrant and then the escrow agent will give the key so that they can obviously do the 21st century equivalent of tapping a phone line. And then another cool thing we could look at doing is M of N control. I really wish that we just call this a simpler name and that is shared custodianship. And what happens here is we could have three people or now let's be reasonable. Let's say we've got four people that could do a thing. We need two of them to do it. So for example, if I want to encrypt the backup of my database, what I would do is I'd have two people that are allowed to recover the data um, that have different keys. And both keys need to be there. So that's the idea of M of N control. The one person can't do the task without the other. And this will decrease the chance of a malicious insider. Because the more people involved in a conspiracy, the more likely somebody's going to make a mistake, slip up, or grow a conscience. Okay, but please be aware though, decreasing the chance of something is not the same as eliminating it. Next up, let's look at some cryptographic implementations. So first up, before we run ahead of ourselves and implement things, let's just look at the states data can be in. So data can be at rest, which means it's sitting somewhere in storage. And in a lot of cases, that's where data spends most of its life, sitting there waiting to be used or waiting to be sent. And that's one of the other states, data in transit. That's usually data traveling over the network, for example. Or you could argue as well, data traveling through a USB cable to an external hard drive is also data in transit. But you're more likely to have an attacker intercept data over a network than with that little USB cable that comes with your external hard drive. Please try and stick to that one because we've got those um, malicious cables now. And we also have data in use, which is sitting in RAM or busy being processed by your CPU right now. Okay, now with that in mind, With data at rest, we can encrypt it. That's cool. With data in transit, we can encrypt it. That's cool. With data in use, um, it's not really doable to encrypt it. We have got some methods that can sort of encrypt the data that is currently in RAM, but more about it's more about trying to control access to the data rather than trying to obfuscate or jumble it up with cryptography. Okay, so now let's talk about some scenarios like Disk encryption, the obvious way to do data at rest encryption. Now, usually with uh, disk encryption, a block cipher is ideal as your block cipher is actually pretty effective, especially when the processing and the data activity is taking place locally on the computer. Another nice benefit to the block ciphering is the blocks can either align or be a fraction of the sector size of a disk. So it makes it map very nicely to your disk and just helps the encryption and then writing of the encryption and the decryption and reading of it that little bit easier. Uh, usually also it's nice to do a symmetric key for this as well. Seeing as the data is not leaving that computer, the keys 
not really a big issue because if I get onto your computer and I get the symmetric key for the data on your computer, well, I've, I've got both. It's not going to make a big difference. Uh, if you try to do asymmetric, which remember is more processing intensive and therefore slower to do, if I get onto your computer and access both the encryption key and the decryption key and your data, well, yeah, it's just as bad. So you might as well take advantage of Symmetric's better performance for the data on your computer. Now, in terms of doing disk encryption, you can look at doing full disk encryption. This could either be software-driven, such as Microsoft's BitLocker, or it could be hardware-driven using what's called a self-encrypting drive, or SED. I try not to call it a SED because people just get confused. Now, there's trade-offs to both. Um, with software-driven encryption, it has to be enabled. And if it's not, well, it's not going to help you. And then how is the encryption going to be driven? Using BitLocker as an example, you could either do BitLocker in password mode where the user has to punch in a password which seeds the cryptographic key. It's not actually the key itself. The thing the user types in, the decryption password basically, is going to be converted into the key and then used to do the decryption operation. Um, problem with that though is you're relying on the users choosing a good password. And in a lot of situations, that password is not tied to the password policy that would be used on the user's account. So that's a bit of an iffy thing. Or alternatively, you could use the TPM module, in which case then the computer needs to have at least a TPM 1.2 or higher. And obviously, if you're rocking Windows 11, you definitely want to try and make sure you're using at least a TPM 2.0 or higher for some of that operating system's cryptographic capabilities. Uh, and another thing as well is you also need to make sure you've got your recovery keys preserved as well. Because if you don't look after your recovery key and something goes wrong, you can have a problem. So self-encrypting drives, they have all the encryption and decryption taking place locally. Very little interaction and choice is required by the user or the administrator, which is cool. But when self-encrypting drives go haywire, they go haywire. And in a lot of instances, I've seen people not use the self-encrypting drive's key backup utility because they don't have to do much to take advantage of the self-encrypting drive and the possibility of it failing and you needing the recovery key doesn't dawn on them until it's too late. So try and be one of the elites and back up your keys regardless of whether it's software-driven FDE or hard drive-driven FDE. Sorry, FDE being full disk encryption. You could also look at doing partition encryption. Uh, where you encrypt partition by partition on your hard drive. This is pretty cool because you could have a data or OS partition that's encrypted and then a booting partition that is left unencrypted. So that's a pretty cool option. But I would rather go volumetric encryption, which is where you take advantage of things like your file encryption. And file level encryption is actually a very, very good idea. Because with file level encryption, you are able to encrypt and decrypt individual files. Now, the main comparison for the storage encryption is usually, do I do full disk encryption? Which is a lot harder for the attacker to crack. But it only encrypts the data when you shut down. And all of the data needs to be decrypted when the system starts up. So it's a bit of everything or nothing, really. Whereas your file level encryption... It's easier for the attacker to crack, but the decryption takes place at user login and the encryption takes place when that user logs out, which means that any files that are inaccessible to you or me because of permissions remain encrypted, making it more persistent. Now, this debate is not really a case of, oh, I should do one or the other. You can do both. Because with full disk encryption, that's protecting against hard drive theft. When people want to steal data, a real possibility is they could come along and rather open up the computer or the server and steal the hard drive rather than the whole machine. Because a hard drive is a lot easier to hide on your person. And if you get caught, it's a lot easier to run with a hard drive than it is a whole machine. So that's where the full disk encryption is usually better. And the file level encryption is usually better for when you're trying to stop uh, malicious insiders or threat actors that are somehow remotely accessing your environment from viewing files and um, uh, making copies of them when they're not running with a profile that has access to said file. So ideally, use both. 
So if you're in a Windows environment, for instance, um, BitLocker would be a great full disk encryption option. And then tucked away under your volume properties in the uh, File Explorer, when you right-click on one of your disks, is the option for EFS, or the Encrypted File System, which is part of Microsoft's uh, NTFS file system. So definitely something worth looking at. Another cryptographic implementation to deal with is transmissions for data in transit. In this situation, stream ciphers are usually better because as you are ready to transmit the data, the stream cipher can be doing the encryption operation piece by piece. And due to the fact that the transmission is taking place over public media that where you can't be 100% certain you can trust everybody there, asymmetric encryption makes more sense. Now, usually for this to be set up, we rely quite a lot on something called a cipher suite. A cipher suite is basically a collection of various cryptographic algorithms that you could be used to encrypting and decrypt data. And you get these cipher suites because either they are part of your operating system and just keeping your operating system up to date usually updates your existing ones or brings in new ones as mandated by your OS vendor. It also might be part of your network applications, like your web browser, your mail client, etc. Another reason why you see people sometimes demand that you be on at least a particular version of Firefox or Chrome or whatever browser it is you prefer using. Or you could manually obtain and install these. But there is a catch with Cypher Suites. Cypher Suites are negotiated. So you and I could decide to communicate using cryptography. And what will happen is, as part of the setup for the cryptographic session, we will discuss what cipher suites we each have. And we will settle on the best that both sides can manage. So if you've got the better cipher suite and I've got the inferior one, I've got bad news. Because I've got the inferior one, I will use the best of what I have. And that means you are not running at your best. You're going to ma match me. So it's always a good idea where you can to try and either drive people to use more modern updated software or if both devices are within your control that you keep those devices as up to date from an operating system and application perspective. And if you've done manual installation obviously just double check that it is being updated so that you have got access to improved and new ciphers. Alright, now another important thing to look at encryption is databases. I mean, let's be realistic. We've already identified that that's what attackers want, data. In some way or form, they want your data. And your database is obviously a fantastic target. So let's look at what we could do for encryption. So block ciphering is pretty popular uh, for databases as the blocks can align with the records or the individual data, data fields within a record. Uh, in terms of the encryption and decryption, uh, symmetric or asymmetric, honestly, it's difficult to say which one's right because both have benefits. A very common choice is to go symmetric, seeing as a database is a type of data storage and improves performance. That way, at least your database doesn't become laggy to make it secure. But asymmetric helps when you've got um, database transactions taking place, like reading, writing, editing, and so forth. Uh, over a network connection, so it's a case of one or the other, or maybe both, just in different circumstances. Now, here's where it gets interesting. How you can encrypt the database. You can do basically the database level where the entire thing gets encrypted. This is very similar to the problems we run into with full disk encryption. Either the entire thing is encrypted or it is not. So, for example, maybe a database that gets accessed rarely like maybe once a month, once a year, this could be a decent option. Um, or maybe when you're doing a backup of your database, doing database level encryption on it might be a good idea as well. But uh, for databases that are accessed more frequently, record level would probably be a better idea, where you're encrypting and decrypting individual records within the database, basically like rows in a spreadsheet. So if somebody's working with um, my customer record, for example, and a business I, pay, I um, deal with, then that record gets decrypted while the other customer's data remains encrypted. So that's pretty cool. Or you could even go down to the cell level where the individual data field within a record gets encrypted and decrypted. It's a lot more granular and 
can be quite beneficial, especially if you only need to have people working with parts of a record, not the entire record. Like, for example, with privacy legislation, if I have some sort of identity number in my country or a social security number or something similar to that, the staff member at the workplace that I am doing business with doesn't necessarily need to know that number. They just need to know my name and my surname and my contact number, for instance. So those particular cells in the database could be decrypted, while other parts that identify me uniquely for KYC and other types of um, financial fraud legislations and frameworks would remain encrypted to adhere to privacy protections and privacy policies. Okay, another cool thing we can do is something called an encrypted key exchange. This is actually pretty neat. Um, and some of you might have already had this idea a little bit earlier on when we were looking at symmetric and asymmetric and talking about their strengths and weaknesses. We could use asymmetric encryption to protect and exchange asymmetric key. So the idea is the symmetric key can be protected by the asymmetric exchange and be either used for a long time or just treat it as a session key. In a lot of cases, an encrypted key exchange is usually used as a way to have a session key. So the way it's going to work out if we do an encrypted key exchange is this. We'll have device A and device B, and they're going to sort themselves out with their asymmetric encryption as usual, doing their key exchange. Nothing new here yet. Where it gets different, though, is instead of plain text data, device A has a symmetric key that it goes and encrypts using device B's public key. And that gives us ciphertext. Safe to transmit. Device B gets the ciphertext and wants to decrypt it using the appropriate cipher and obviously uses his private key like it did earlier. And that allows device A to send a symmetric key across the network in a fairly secure fashion. After which device A and device B can now communicate using the symmetric key to encrypt the plain text data and transmit the cipher data and then decrypt with the same symmetric key, the plain text data. That's a pretty cool option. Right, now let's have a look at a fairly tricky thing for cryptographic implementations. Something called perfect forward secrecy. So if you're busy preparing for CompTIA Security Plus, this is not heavy in the exam. This is not really a big thing in the exam topics. So you need a surface level understanding of what's going on here. But I put together a little diagram to try and explain this to you. And obviously if you want to pause, zoom in and stuff like that on this diagram, feel free to do so. But the basic overall picture, the high level explanation here, is you can have two entities, device A and device B, create a secret and public value per session. And what they do then is they exchange those public values with one another. Not keys, they're just numerical values. And they can use that to derive the secret values from those exchanges. It's sort of like when people tell you, think of a number, add this to it, minus this, no, 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 no. And then they tell you what number you were thinking of. And, or they tell you what number you just calculated. That kind of mental trick is sort of what's going on here. Two semi-random values, we can figure out the related private random values not, not shared. And this allows for device A and device B to derive a symmetric key that was created for that session. It hasn't been used before, so any historically intercepted data is not at risk, and it will not get used again after the session, so nothing in the future will get affected either. This is basically a way of generating and deriving a perfectly symmetrical key for a session without needing to do something like an encrypted key exchange where we do asymmetric encryption just to do symmetric. Let's try and walk our way through this diagram. So we've got device A on the left and device B on the right. Device A and device B agree on some values. Now those two values are P and G, and they do that publicly. Now, after doing that agreement on values P and G, Device A chooses a random value of A, lowercase, privately. And B chooses a value of B, privately, lowercase variable. Device A will then calculate the value of uppercase A, which is going to become a very important value later, 
are as g to the power of a modulated by p. And then they send the value of capital A to b. b does the same thing, just with a different set of variables. b creates a variable called capital B and then uses g to the power of lowercase b modulated by p and sends the value of capital B to device A. Then device A takes a formula. The symmetric key will be equal to capital B to the power of lowercase a modulated by p and device B takes the value of uh, cap capital A to the power of lowercase b modulated to the value of p to derive its symmetric key. And due to a little bit of cool mathematical trickery, the symmetric keys will be the same on both sides. If you are going, holy hell, that is confusing. Don't feel bad, this is overkill. You don't necessarily need to understand the mathematics involved to appreciate that this is a good security solution. Uh, just as, for example, somebody who's very good at driving a car doesn't necessarily need to understand how to fix their car themselves. Um, you don't have to be a mechanic to drive a car well. And vice versa. Just because a mechanic knows how a car works doesn't mean they're very good drivers. Personal experience, you don't want to know. Okay, now a couple of interesting things about our cryptography. You're going to hear about things like salting and stretching passwords. Salting. Why are we seasoning our security? Now, salting isn't that kind of salt. What we're doing here is we're adding random bits of data to something before encrypting or hashing it. A very common thing to salt would be a password. So a lot of operating systems are going to not store your password in an encrypted format. They store it using a hash value. So when I'm setting my password, I type whatever I want it to be, and my operating system, whether it's Windows or Linux or whatever, will take that password and hash it. And then when I log in in the future, that login screen takes what I type into that password entry field and hashes it and compares the hash value. Now, if the hash values are the same, obviously I type the, pa the correct password. If they're different, I made a typo, which is why a computer cannot tell you, or at least a good computer, a good operating system, a good application, cannot tell you what you got wrong in your password. It can just tell that you got it wrong, and that's it. The problem is, though, attackers came up with this thing called a rainbow table. So what they did is they took every possible password they could think of and ran it through the hash function that an operating system would use, resulting in every possible hash value. And then the attacker just needs to get your hash value, find it in their table, and see what the corresponding input was. Oh, dear. But what we can do is we can mess with the attacker. If my computer adds a few extra binary bits into my password at semi-random locations when I'm creating that password, my password plus those extra bits get hashed. And then when I log in, I type my password and my computer takes the same bits that you chose earlier and puts them in the same positions that it chose earlier before hashing and comparing the hash values of what it stored versus what it just calculated. And if that matches, fantastic. But if the attacker tries to rainbow table it, they look up the hash value and they're seeing what I typed plus the salt. If they try and type that, they'll end up typing my password plus the salt and my computer adds the salt again, offsetting the hash value, making it wrong. And no one likes having too much salt in their food. Even if you are a fan of um, uh, the seasoning, no one wants their food to be too salty, right? Then it becomes unpleasant. That's why we call it salt in the table. Another thing we also need to look, look at is the possibility of having to do a key stretch. Now, the idea of a key stretch is it's meant to strengthen a weak key or password by doing a couple of different things. The methods include adding more data, like padding it or salting it. Um, I'm not too mad about the padding because padding is usually done with a repeating series of values, like binary zeros, for example. And that can potentially lead to patterns in the key. And patterns in the encryption and decryption possibly make cryptanalysis easier. Salting's a bit better, um, but the idea is to spread it out a bit. Fill, fill out the key to make sure it's as long as possible. For instance, usually when you're setting up your WPA2 encryption on wireless, you get told you can type anywhere between 8 and 32 characters as a passphrase. Well, if you don't type 32 characters, it pads the characters you didn't use. 
so that the key is appropriately lengthened when it derives the key from the passphrase. So that needs to be borne in mind. Another method of key stretching or padding is to do what's called an even distribution block. And then basically if I couldn't fit all of the key into a, an appropriate number of blocks, we'll rather divide it equally so that all blocks have the same number of empty spots and then fill those spots with data. That's one method. Another method would be repeated rounds of encryption. Encrypt it once with one key, encrypt it again, possibly with another key, encrypt it yet again. I'm not overly mad about repeating rounds of encryption to stretch and strengthen a key because all you're doing is giving yourself more processing work to give the attacker more processing work. And technically, yes, we are doing that with encryption, but it's an exponential relationship. Yes, I have to do a bit more processing to encrypt and decrypt data, but an attacker who doesn't have my key values needs to do exponentially more work. But if I've got a weak solution, a weak key, a weak algorithm, whatever, like the original data encryption standard, um, and I repeat that encryption over and over, all I'm doing is giving myself more work to just increase the attacker by a fairly proportional but definitely not exponential amount of work, which is not an ideal situation. Now, let's look at blockchain. Wait, isn't this cryptography? Yeah, and blockchain is related to cryptography, whether you like it or not. But uh, first of all, just separate blockchain and cryptocurrency in your mind for a bit, please. They are closely related, as cryptocurrencies do use blockchain networks extensively. But you can use blockchain networks for a variety of other things. So what exactly is it then? Well, the idea of a blockchain is it's a decentralized network of computational nodes maintaining a ledger of transactional data. So when two people exchange information with each other, the rest of the network can validate that data exchange as having taken place or not having taken place, which is pretty cool. So what happens with the decentralized network is everybody who's part of it is contributing to maintaining the ledger or the record of what's happened. Uh, usually this, or at least originally, this was done through computational work. Um, everybody gave a bit of their computer's processing capability to maintain the records. Now the way a blockchain is going to happen is somebody will create a blockchain algorithm and they create block zero, also known as the genesis block. Yeah, a little bit of a biblical reference. I didn't choose the term, I'm afraid, but anyway. Now the problem with block zero is you have to trust it inherently. You have to trust that whoever created that blockchain algorithm or that particular blockchain implementation did so with good intent and legit reasons. But then again, we trust the root certificate authority server because it's got a certificate that says, you can trust me. So it's not too different in the principle. But then what happens is when the next person wants to transact some data and have that data added to the blockchain, everybody computes that operation and block one is formed. Now what will happen in block one is it will contain the information that was exchanged, the transactional event, and then it references the hash value of block zero. And it's done so in a way that can be quite computationally demanding and requires everybody, or at least a majority of the network, to agree that should be what goes into block one. That should be the hash value. Then, when the next person wants to have their data added to the chain, block two, block two can only be added once block one is completed. And block two has all the transactional event information embedded and the hash value of block one. And the thing is, you can't bullshit the hash value of block one because block one contains the hash value of block zero. Rinse and repeat. Then, somebody else comes along, block three. Event data and a hash that covers the previous data. Fantastic. On and on we go until we are at whatever block number we want to be. Now, the reason why this can be quite secure, despite being available to everybody that's maintaining this, is the computational work. If I want to either reverse the transaction or the event of block two or corrupt it, I have got to go and recalculate the value of block two and every subsequent block that came after it. 
So the further back the tampering goes, the more work the person has to do. So if we're on block 1 million, and I want to go and fraudulently manipulate block 2. I've got to go and recalculate block 2, get everybody to agree to it. Block 3, get everybody to agree to it. Rinse and repeat, or at least, if not get everybody, 51% of the network. Cool. Now, if you're still a little bit fuzzy on, okay, but how does that work? Um, cool example I came across a couple of years ago that really works well to understand blockchain. Apologies to anybody who does not like gambling. But let's say a bunch of people want to sit down and play poker. But they've only got the cards. They've got no tokens. They've got no matches. But they do have pen and paper. So the people sit down and agree, okay, we're going to bet this much. This is what we're going to start out with. And every time somebody makes a bet, we everybody writes down that bet. So-and-so bet $5. So-and-so bet $10. Um, So-and-so won that round and got $15. You get the idea. And if somebody tries to lie and say, oops, I didn't actually like that. I bet too much and I lost. And they try and scratch that out. Everybody else has that transaction that that one person scratched out. So as long as the majority agrees, no, 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 that thing happened. You are probably lying. That's how the blockchain can be trusted. It's a pretty cool idea, actually. But it's not without its fault. It does have some concerns. So, for example, the 51% attack. If you have a situation where 51% of the network is controlled by one bad entity, you could have a bad time. But as long as 51% of the network is not controlled by one entity, it's distributed by independent individuals, you will not be able to have fraudulent blocks being added. You will not be able to reverse the data blocks, and you will not be able to delete any data blocks. Why? Because you would need to have an inordinate amount of processing power to go and recalculate and redo the whole ledger up to this point before anybody realized the changes had taken place. And with some of the blockchains that are currently in the public domain right now, they are so long that I don't think anybody has that computational power. Maybe a quantum computer? I don't know. I'd need to look into that. But it's pretty cool. Now, one of the annoying things about blockchain technology is it is very closely tied to cryptocurrencies. And that is because things like Bitcoin were one of the first uses of blockchain technology that really went mainstream. So a lot of people think blockchain and cryptocurrencies are synonyms when actually cryptocurrencies use blockchain. That doesn't mean they are inseparable from one another. A blockchain can contain data that is not considered financial, although tracking financial transactions could be pretty cool. But I've seen proposals for using blockchain for online voting, identity and access management systems, notarization, government data auditing, which I know I could definitely get behind. All of that stuff could be part of a blockchain and publicly maintained. The only catch is you kind of need to get that decentralized network to have a reason to want to dedicate computing time and resources to performing this operation. Yeah. I could probably do a whole lesson on this if I really wanted to. But we'll see how it goes. If you guys are interested, I'll think about doing it maybe. But I don't want to become one of those crypto bros trying to convince you to buy whatever is the latest fad coin. Don't want you guys losing money. I want you to make money. All right. Now, what about obfuscation? Obfuscation is actually a pretty cool idea. It's the idea of hiding data in a unusual way. You might think, hang on, but isn't that encryption? Yes, but... Steganography, on the other hand, is where I'm hiding data in plain sight. What happens is we can embed text data into multimedia files, like pictures, audio, and video. And if you don't know that there is text data embedded in a picture, you would be none the wiser. No, seriously, you wouldn't be. I've seen steganographic utilities operate. The most you would ever notice is the pixel shifting a shade of color, ever so slightly you probably wouldn't notice. I mean, I've been doing it for the last two minutes on the screen in the video, and I bet you haven't noticed which pixel I've changed. Mm. Go back and try and find it. Let me know if you spot where I've embedded some data into this video. But moving along. So this is quite cool, because I could exchange data in a very public way, and people would be none the wiser. 
And as long as you've got the correct steganographic utility, you could extract that data. Ooh. But um, there are limitations, obviously. It doesn't do well with, like, for example, a file with pictures and graphics and stuff like that because you want to try and embed text data into multimedia data. You don't want to put multimedia in multimedia. And it can be very difficult to detect as, surprisingly, sometimes the picture, if you're using a, a picture, ends up being smaller after the data gets embedded in it, which is kind of crazy. It's quite cool, but it's not technically encryption because if I take a picture that I suspect has steganographic data in it and I run it through a variety of steganographic tools, I will be able to extract the data. Um, there's no like password protecting or anything like that. So the idea is hiding in plain sight, but as soon as someone's suspicious, they could find it. Another technique is something called data masking. We borrow the idea from various privacy legislations where basically we cover up some data and we don't allow it to be used unless it is absolutely necessary and it receives the appropriate privilege and authorization. The thing I went on earlier about like as a customer having a social security number or an ID number of some kind, um, if that's not needed for somebody to deal with me as, the, as their customer, that data should remain masked. But if you do need a way to uniquely identify somebody without using accurate data, you could try tokenizing or su substituting data. So instead of using my ID number or social security or whatever my country uses to recognize me as a citizen or as an individual citizen, should I rather say, we could replace that with a customer number. So I could be customer number 273. And that could be the unique value that identifies me in the system rather than something that is considered personally identifiable. Uh, another technique is to do de-identification, where you disassociate the data. Uh, de-identification is basically tokenizing and replacing that sensitive data, but not completely throwing it away. What would happen is I would take the token value and the original sensitive data and stick it in a highly secure database that is only ever accessed when I absolutely positively need to have that sensitive data. And in that case, I probably would make that my irregularly accessed full database encrypted database from earlier. All right, so that's a couple of cool technologies and ideas that exist alongside hashing and cryptography and stuff like that. But that is all I need to cover with you guys for now. As I said, this is based on Linux Professional Institute Security Essentials, CompTIA Security Plus, and a couple of other certifications. And the idea here is that you understand some of the concepts around cryptography. So that if I tell you, hey, here is a cipher suite, here is a particular cryptographic algorithm, you can ask, okay, how long is the key? What kind of key is it? Is it block? Is it stream? You can ask those intelligent questions and understand them. And using some of those guys, like I told you, like in general, the longer the key, the better. But remember, symmetric keys can get away with being shorter than asymmetric keys and still be considered good. That kind of stuff will go a long way. And that's what Compt is doing with their Security Plus nowadays, is they obviously want to make sure that you know the here and now stuff that's very useful but also that the foundation is laid for an entire career in cybersecurity. But uh, I'd like to thank you all for watching this. And if you haven't already, please like, please sub. And if you know anybody that could benefit from this, don't be afraid to share. Thanks for watching this, though. And I'll catch you in the next one.